afternoon. It's uh, 4 p.m. Uh, and welcome to uh, this edition, this week's edition of uh, Digital Transformation Thursday. Uh, we're very happy to, to have you here and uh, we're very excited for today's uh, session. Uh, uh, today's session, we will focus on uh, copyright in the digital domain. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a very timely, a very timely topic. Certainly, uh, when uh, when I started in, in the practice, uh, uh, digital uh, copyright issues uh, in this in this area was really a, a major major concern uh, and something that uh, spawned a lot of the early uh, litigation uh, and cases that were uh, litigated in the U.S. concerning things like um, uh, oh my God what was that called. <laughs> uh, is it, well, now BitTorrent, but back then it was uh, the, the earlier, the earlier file sharing sites, uh, from that to Kaza to uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's been a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting space uh, if you're if you're following it. Um, and we're very happy and very very, very glad to have a, a powerhouse panel today uh, with us. Uh, uh, joining us as our first speaker is the uh, Director General of the Intellectual Property Office, uh, 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 Secretary, or sorry, uh, uh, Attorney Roel Barba. He's a graduate of the UP College of Law uh, uh, and uh, was formerly a, uh, the uh, Chief Legal Counsel of the JACA Group and RFM Corporation before joining the government uh, at the Department of Trade and Industry, where he last uh, acted as the Undersecretary for the Office of the Secretary uh, and served as the Supervising Undersecretary of the IPO the PESA, the NDC, the PITC as attached agencies of the DTI, and concurrently sat at the board of Marina, PPA, and CESA. He is now the uh, also the Cagayan Economic Zone Authority acting chairman, and he's also a governor of the board uh, board of investments. Uh, and he's uh, and he was for a while for a time the IBP governor for Southern Luzon. I'd like you to welcome uh, Director General uh, Roel Barba of the Intellectual Property Office. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney JJ. Um, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dicini Boted and uh, Dicini uh, for this series of webinars on various topics. And uh, before I proceed, I would like to greet uh, everybody, everyone, good afternoon. My friends, my classmates who are present uh, here this afternoon. The main challenges for creative laborers, no matter how much circumstances have evolved due to technology, are always the same. How do we secure ownership and cement that ownership? How do we best monetize our works? What are the tools and strategies available to us to protect our copyright? What can and should we do when our rights are infringed on? The big difference today is that technology has added a whole complex web to the challenges that we need new sustainable methods and policies for protecting creators and their works while ensuring the public's right to consume these works. At IPOFIL, we find that a key strategy to finding well-balanced policies is engaging with all creative content producers and users. And we have been doing so more aggressively at the start of the local outbreak. Just earlier this month, uh, we held our first two-day online international copyright forum that was participated in by close to 200 people in Zoom and was simultaneously watched by 9,700 or almost 10,000 viewers in the Bureau's FB page. While the forum has highlighted the challenges of artists during the COVID crisis particularly, Discussions also magnified the issues in digital environments, given that streaming, video on demand platforms, user uploaded content platforms, online marketplaces are helping businesses, including creative industries, to survive and recover. Now, what is the key takeaway from discussions during that forum? Our key takeaway is that efficient management of copyright and related rights is a must in the digital age more than ever. And this effort must be launched through a whole of society approach with government, the private sector, content owners and platforms playing a part 
and ensuring the copyright regime achieves its objective of stimulating creativity for economic, societal, and cultural development. As one of its responses to digital challenges, IPOPIL recently issued its updated rules for the accreditation of collective management organizations, or what we call CMOs. The new rules not only promote individual creators to top CMOs, for them to more easily monitor their revenues from licensing deals, but it also ensures that CMOs have standard capabilities to perform as copyright managers. This is just one of the implementing rules and regulations we just issued. In addition to the IRR for the accreditation of CMOs, four other IRRs on copyright registration, government use, resale rights, and dispute resolution were published in today's issue of the Philippine Star. So we will be guided by these IRRs effective 5 September 2020. Our Bureau of Copyrights and Related Rights, our Bureau of Copyright and Related Rights has also launched an online system for depositing copyrighted works. Having their works in national depositories gives creators confidence in the protection of their works once they exploit it. Since the launch of the electronic registry and depository system last July 15, the BCRR has received 21 applications as of 17 August 2020, and the number is increasing every day. This clearly shows the resilience of artists to continuously create and develop creative works even during this pandemic, and at the same time ensuring the protection of their copyright. This registration would eventually encourage more artists to register and deposit their works at IPOFIL in an easy, safe, and convenient way without leaving their homes. Depositing one's works is valuable that it adds a layer of legitimate evidence on one's ownership over a copyrighted work. As such, the electronic deposit system is truly really beneficial to the sector, especially in these difficult times. Through the BCRR, we have also been doubling efforts to educate industries on copyright for them to have greater appreciation of their rights. As mentioned, we had the first international copyright webinar this August, which also aimed to engage those from the music sector. We're hoping to hold more comprehensive discussions like this in the coming months with more focus on different sectors. Another issue we're tackling ag aggressively is piracy especially that there has been a rise in complaints during the quarantine period. From March to June, our enforcement office received a total of 67 complaints for various IP rights violating acts. The figure already exceeds the 47 we received for the entire 2019. Of the quarantine reports, piracy accounted for the biggest at 42% or 28 reports. Piracy included movies, TV shows, anime series, and perhaps because of distance learning, we also saw a rise in the illegal distribution of e-textbooks. Now, what is IPOFIL doing to improve the enforcement environment in the online space? Our IEO has crafted a revised version of the 2013 rules in the exercise of enforcement functions and one of the main highlights of the proposed amendments is to explicitly cover in its enforcement power IP rights infringing activities conducted online. One of the specific revisions is that we will allow the IEO through the Director General to act on a verified complaint by ordering platforms to take down IP rights violating posts. We can do this through a warning notice and compliance order. At present, what happens is that the IP rights holder is the only one who has the authority to request a takedown. Unfortunately, not all sites or platforms comply. But if it is the IP field, IP field that, does that, that will do it, we believe it will be more compelling for the violator to comply. The proposed amendments also expand the definition of the enforcement order to include the permanent takedown 
blocking, and removal of infringing online sites or accounts. Assist and desist order, an order to remove counterfeit and pirated goods from digital and or electronic platforms or physical establishments. With this, IPOFIL can ask the National Telecommunications Commission or NTC, the primary agency that regulates telecom services, to cut access to an IP rights violating site. The proposed amendments have gone through consultation with stakeholders. IEO is just fine tuning the amendments to incorporate comments from the consultation and written comments. And I expect it in my office at the start of the next quarter. However, we believe systems across all branches of government must work in harmony. As such, we are pushing for amendments to the IP code that will institutionalize further improvements in the copyright-based sector. We intend to submit our new proposal for the amendments of the IP code within two months. Just last August 6, 2020, uh, just before the MECQ, we just signed an MOU on technical assistance under the financial sector and intellectual property program of the United Kingdom Prosperity Fund with the British Embassy in Manila. And part of that program is an activity to conduct capacity building activities that will promote IP and support the creative sector. Combating piracy and helping creators fully extract the economic value of their works is timely as the country moves at a turning point where many see the creative economy as its next growth driver. To realize this goal, measures must be in place. Actions must be taken to demonstrate that the Philippine government does not tolerate activities that discourage and stifle the creation of creative and innovative works that are the backbone of a rich culture and a progressive economy. Thank you and a fruitful day to all. With me are uh, the Director of uh, Bureau of Copyrights, uh, Director Emer Cuyo, uh, Attorney Chuck Valerio, and Attorney Louis Calvario, who can uh, help me answer your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, DG uh, Barba. We're very happy for that. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, uh, strangely enough, back when uh, I was in, uh, in law school, um, there was only one professor teaching intellectual property law, and uh, that was uh, Professor uh, Steve Bautista, who uh, was, I believe, the author of uh, PD49, which was the copyright law at that time. And uh, in that class, there were only four of us who signed up for intellectual property law, unlike today, where there are two sections of, uh, or three, uh, three sections of intellectual property law. And the four of us were, it was myself. Uh, one is, uh, I believe, uh, we're still trying to confirm, I believe it was Andrew Ong, who is now with the World Intellectual Property Office. The other one was Anton, Anton Bengson, who is an intellectual property practitioner. And the fourth one is our next speaker, uh, Attorney Marivic Benedito. And it was a very strange class because we would hold it in Professor uh, Steve Bautista's office, which later became my office in the law center. So there's four of us uh, seated uh, in front of his desk, his office desk. And uh, like all law school subjects, we still have to stand when we recite, even though there were only four of us. And you can imagine when, when uh, I think there was one afternoon where Anton Bengson didn't show up, we were all angry with him because suddenly the, the number of times we got called got longer. <laughs> And I think it was just uh, Marivik and myself who were, uh, who were uh, affected by that. So uh, attorney Marivik Benedicto is the head of media publishing and new media for music at ABS-CBN Productions Inc. Uh, she is, uh, I want to say that she will soon be, uh, well, ABS-CBN. So I guess you know <laughs> where that is headed. She's a graduate of the UP College of Law, my classmate from 1993. She's the head of, uh, she was the head of Star Songs and Star Recording. Uh, previously, she was uh, head of business and legal affairs at Viva Records Corporation, uh, where I'm, I myself uh, did work there before at Viva, and uh, um, and she was also the executive director of the Optical Media Board. If I'm not mistaken, I think she was the first uh, Optical Media Board executive director, and she was uh, at the time also worked at uh, at the Supreme Court. So we're very happy to 
uh, have uh, Attorney Maravic Benedicto um, to talk about, um, I guess uh, the topic will be more on uh, the business of copyright in relation to digital music, which is her, uh, her industry. Welcome, Maravic. So, hello, hello, JJ. Hi, Director General Barba. Hello, Emerson and uh, Emerson, lang, no? <laughs> sorry. Uh, and of course, the Attorney Louie of IPO, uh, Attorney Jack. Um, good afternoon to everyone, and I'm very happy to be here to, this afternoon. Uh, an employee of ABS CBN Film Productions Inc. Uh, we're st I still have work, thankfully. <laughs> so, uh, we're very uh, fortunate to be in in the not in uh, well in the creative sec uh, the creative side the creation side. So um, I handle music publishing and um, new media, of course, and that's the reason uh, why I'm here today. Um, wait, I'll just uh, JJ asked me to talk um, parang candy dilang about the industry. So I hope you will be able to appreciate uh, what I'll talk about today. Mm. Sorry, yeah, here we go. Is it ano na? Naka-share na ba? Yan, okay. So, it's sharing, yeah. There you go. I'd like to talk about the music industry, how we survived the digital revolution, and now how we are surviving a pandemic. So I actually am the president of the Philippine Association of the Record Industry, or PARI. PARI is the Association of Local and International Recording Companies and Producers. So we were organized in 1972, so we're almost 50 years old now. Um, our role in the industry is to advocate the interests of the music industry, uh, promote the development of the local industry through the AWIT Awards, which is actually on its 33rd year this year. We maintain the industry awards, yung uh, adopt standard practices, for example, uh, when it comes to computation, uh, talking to DSPs, and before we were talking also to outlets like SM and the record bars. Uh, we certify the Gold and Platinum Awards, and we issue ISRC, which is the International Standard Recording Code. We are the national agency that's uh, authorized to issue this. What is the ISRC? It's a unique and permanent um, code for the identification of sound recordings. So you need this if you want to upload your, uh, your song to Spotify. You need an ISRC code. Okay. So we gather industry data. We work together with the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry. And uh, used to be that our biggest job was anti-piracy. Uh, but now we're not uh, too active in anti-piracy. Uh, PARI members are, there are eight corporate members and, uh, sorry, 12 corporate members and eight associate members. So we're very glad that uh, we had a couple of, well, we had three new members last year, which were Dito Music, uh, BMPI, which is Wish FM, and Tower of Doom. Uh, it just shows that people are recognizing the need to be part of this association and to lobby for each other's interests. Okay, so where are we in the music industry ecosystem? We are right there. Uh, we represent the producers. We have majors and local producers, and we are a trade association of stakeholders. Um, we also have uh, an affiliate uh, association or a, a CMO called Sounds Right. Sounds Right collects the performance royalties under Section 209 of Re Republic Act 8292. Okay. So well, we, if we want to talk about music and technology, uh, I think the first thing that we need to, to understand is that the evolution of music has always been about technology. So the Gutenberg Press, which was invented in 1439, made it possible for the church to distribute copies of liturgical music to churches all over Europe and thus standardize the music played during mass. From this, a system of notation evolved into what is now the Western Musical Notation System, which standardized, uh, sorry, which standardized the written language of music and allowed musicians to write down records of their work so that other musicians could read and replicate their music for other audiences. This uh, sparked a lively discussion of music among musicians across Europe and accelerated the propagation and development of music 
leading to the rich cultural ages of the Baroque, Classical, and Romantic eras, or what is today remembered as the golden age of European classical music. It also meant spreading the music beyond the chambers of royal benefactors, of composers, and musicians, and allowing the public to hear their music for the first time. The Industrial Revolution offered the mass production of instruments, which made them more affordable and thus gave birth to more orchestras, which were in turn needed to entertain the newly empowered middle class. The invention of electricity led to the invention of the gramophone, which allowed actual performances, not just the notes, to be recorded. Performances of exceptional singers and orchestras could now be heard long after the live performance and long after the artist had left the building. This allowed local performances uh, perform to become regional hits and later national hits with the help of another invention of the second industrial revolution, which is radio. Okay. Radio was important in the early 20th century from World War I to World War II as it became the source of information about the war, the only form of mass entertainment and the best source of music. There was live music on the radio, but also recorded music played from phonograph records, which helped singers get famous and become known in places where they had never performed at. In the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, it saw the rise to popularity of popular mainstream music. Phonograph records originally made of brittle shellac were now made of flexible vinyl that traveled well and could be sold worldwide. Rock and roll became popular and with the rise of television as a mass medium, what artists look like became even more important than their sound. So at this time, the rock star was born. From Elvis Presley to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, the 1950s and 60s saw the rise of another pop culture phenomenon, fans. While fans are not bad per se, pop culture produced music which could be played and sung by non-musicians, perhaps for the first time separating talent and fame. Ironically, the fact that songs were singable even by non-singers made many pop songs accessible to the public and very popular. So, I'm, are you familiar with these photos uh, that I would credit to Getty Images? <laughs> okay. So, the photo below is a, a ticket. Of course, this is of Paul McCartney being escorted out of the Philippines in the very famous incident uh, involving Malhanyang Palace. Uh, the photo below is the Beatles ticket, which uh, cost 20 pesos. Uh, that was the already the grandstand ringside ticket. Also during that time, it was very uh, common for, for record labels to come out with whose picture is uh, that one in sepia was the local Elvis Presley and so on and so forth. Okay, in the 1980s, the cassette became the format of choice. Cassettes and other magnetic media such as the 8-track player allowed uh, music to become portable, which meant that music could be enjoyed anywhere, including cars and public transport. Uh, the players were smaller and cheaper too, so more ex uh, they were more accessible to the public. But, but when Sony released the Walkman, music became personal. Cassettes allowed us to make our personalized mixtapes with our own choice of music. The era, the era of recordable cassettes, however, heralded the start of music piracy. Recordable media meant that copies of entire albums could be duplicated and sold by unauthorized vendors. But cassettes were still analog recordings, and copies made from other ca cassettes suffered a genera uh, generation loss each time they were copied. So the introduction of the CD in the early 90s... Sorry, I have to move my uh, the view here. The introduction of the CD in the early 90s was the start of the digital age for music. The CD had a better sound quality and needed no rewinding. Digital files could be ripped from a CD and duplicated on a computer without generation loss. The CD you see is not a physical copy of a recording, but only a container containing a digital file. The recordable CD of the late 90s was the start of wholesale digital piracy. And later on, it was no longer necessary to save a file onto a CD. They could be saved in media lockers or stored online. The digital revolution was therefore a bane to the music industry. Napster was the first successful P2P or peer-to-peer -peer music service which allowed users to share millions of MP3 music files for free globally. 
It was so successful that users were able to obtain and disseminate advanced copies of an unreleased Metallica demo of the song I Disappear. Met Metallica sued Napster for copyright infringements. Other artists and record companies also sued Napster, and it closed down due to bankruptcy in 2002, but was soon replaced by another illegal, by other illegal P2P services. To evade the law, pirates got more creative and, uh, at how the files were shared and accessed, and later torrent sites were created, allowing fragments of music and not entire songs to be shared via P2P users' computer. The music industry globally suffered huge losses due to P2P piracy and has not yet recovered completely until now. In the early 2000s, Apple released iTunes, and eight months later, it released the iPod, making it possible to download thousands of songs legally. It was successful in the U.S., but not in countries like the Philippines, where credit cards were not popular and where people could not afford to pay for music. In 2007, the first iPhone was released, heralding the era of the smartphone. And today, the smartphone is the primary playback gadget for music. In this we are, uh, era, we are exp experiencing a renewed vigor, thanks in part to two platforms. This is YouTube and Spotify. So how has uh, it been for us? Physical sales have continuously gone down. So from 2001 to 2014, uh, the red bars are the, the represent physical sales. Uh, as of 2014, total streaming, which was Spotify and YouTube, represented only a small portion. And downloads uh, represented the bigger portion. However, recently, downloads have suffered and uh, have grown less and less relevant. And uh, it's now streaming that is... Uh, well, the, the more relevant. However, from 2015 up to the present, actually, uh, the, the industry has grown a lot. It has, uh, streaming has actually been growing very fast. Uh, downloads have been dwindling. But of course, as you know, iTunes has already, uh, Apple has already sort of given up, almost given up iTunes, and uh, Apple Music has taken its place. Okay. So how did we survive this and uh, now start to recover? Today's music industry is very healthy. The top revenue earning our earners for music are just two platforms, YouTube and Spotify. Music is no longer owned, but it's just streamed or it's just used momentarily. There are now 60 million songs available legally and for free. Yet copyright owners are still compensated through ad-supported streaming or subscriptions. Music playback device of choice is the cell phone. And it is now very personal, it is on demand. And actually, as far as the industry is concerned, piracy doesn't really exist anymore. So what was the secret? Uh, actually, streaming became successful because of, of Spotify. And the secret of Spotify is the freemium model. So Spotify was started in 2009 as a way to fight piracy. It's a freemium business model is that uh, there are two tiers. The entry level is free and it's ad supported. It gives free access to more than, uh, at the time, 40 million songs. Spotify's other main feature is the use of playlists. Spotify found that their users spend a lot of emotional investment in creating and personalizing their playlists. And they are emotionally attached to the playlists and the songs they put in them. So much so that, for example, uh, a student, a, a subscriber is just a student and is on a free tier. Uh, four years later, when they graduate and have jobs, they actually convert to premium to the premium tier. So, uh, the statistic of uh, Spotify is that 25% of Spotify's free users convert to paid accounts within the first four years. So, aside from having access to more than 60 million songs, subscribers have high quality music for as little as 30 pesos only per month. Today, Spotify has more than 299 million users, of which 138 million are on paid subscriptions, or 46% of them. They represent, uh, they are present in 92 countries, and in the Philippines, there are more than 2 million paid subscribers as of today. In 2019, streaming revenues worldwide accounted for 56.1% of global revenues. 75% of the revenues came from paid accounts. So that, that statistic is actually true also 
in the Philippines. So what happened this year was, uh, of course, in uh, at the beginning of the year we had uh, uh, we started the, the pandemic started, and uh, we thought that the industry would suffer a lot. However, uh, we soon learned that listening to music is the second most popular activity during quarantine, second only to searching for COVID updates and higher than watching movies on Netflix. On the second day of quarantine, in fact, here in the Philippines, TikTok registers uh, almost 7 million downloads from the Philippines, because of uh, which they donate $1 million to frontliners. Uh, music led the fundraising efforts during the pandemic, the first six months of the pandemic, more than any other art form. Uh, through the efforts of the artists, led, for example, by uh, uh, Professor Ryan Kayabyab, the music industry or mu musicians were able to uh, raise more than 600 million pesos for the, uh, for the fundraising efforts. Another trend is that artists now self-produce music videos at home because they couldn't leave the house, their houses. And uh, for example, um, a young guy like Michael Pacquiao released his DIY single and logged 11 million views in two weeks. Uh, he's still currently the number 26 on trending in the Philippines. So for the future, we wonder sometimes if robots will be able to replace or artificial intelligence will be able to replace people in music making. Of course, we're all used to technology replacing musicians, such as uh, player pianos or self-playing pianos. Um, however, we believe that they can't really replace humans because music is still an emotional experience. It's a form of human expression that speaks from the heart. It expresses emotions that may be difficult to verbalize, and it is the connection between the music creator and the listener who share a common sentiment that makes music a uniquely human activity. In short, music hasn't transformed through the years. It's just the same. It's only the way that we consume music that has evolved. So what we believe is that the old songs will never fade away. Technology may change, platforms may evolve, consumer habits may change, the way we consume content may change, but music is still a strictly human activity. On the other hand, you must embrace technology in order to conquer it. What we learned in the industry is that you either disrupt or you be disrupted. And I would like to leave you with that and also uh, with a reminder, na 10 days na lang, Christmas na. So music will be very relevant again to your realities. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Vic. Don't forget, Thank yeah, don't that. forget to watch Awit Awards on Saturday, August 29, 7 p.m. at facebook.com slash Awit Awards. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks, Mary Vic. So uh, now we get to uh, our Q&A part, and I'd like to uh, invite our, uh, our panelists to uh, I'll put us on gallery view. Um, so that everyone, so I, I'd like to introduce, uh, joining us is attorney Emerson Cuyo who is the director of the Bureau of Copyright and Related Rights, uh, attorney Louis Andrew Calvario, chief of staff of the Office of the Director General, and attorney uh, Ezequiel Valerio, Bureau of Copyright um, and Related Rights, all from the ITO. Uh, welcome. Uh, I wonder Hello. if, uh, yes, thank, thank you for joining us. So we'll take some, uh, some questions from, I know there are a lot of questions. Actually, we're, we're joined from people uh, all over the world. There was uh, somebody uh, logging in. Attorney Hornilia was logging in from, uh, from Las Vegas. Uh, with people uh, from, uh, uh, there was somebody from uh, Cavite, Antipolo, Lipa, Pangasinan. Uh, we're seeing, I say somebody from Abra, Iligan, Cabuyao, Laguna. So welcome everyone. We're uh, very happy for your uh, participation today. Um, I guess we'll take we'll take a question. Uh, there was a question here for, let's see. There's a question here for uh, Attorney Chuck already, yeah. Uh, but what does a follow up question? Uh, hold on, sorry. Um, uh, okay, so the, okay, there's a question here from uh, Laika Lakin Danum. My question is based on experience. Apparently, they have a subscription to an audio stock website for for their videos, and uh, what happened was uh, at one point Facebook claimed it and muted the video. Uh, why was that? They're asking why was that and who would I, who would, uh, who could they raise the concern with? 
the audio website or Facebook. Uh, I wonder if uh, Marivik would have a, an answer for that or any. What's the case that? again? The who owns the recording? So there, I think they signed up for a parang uh, audio stock website. So there's some audio that you can sign up for that you can use on your site. Ah. Yeah. Parang similar to a stock photo agency, ano? Parang exactly. Yata. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. binabada the Facebook take, took it down. <laughs> Uh, what, what the audio site, there? the audio site um, claimed that video, and that's the reason why it was taken down. So the audio site has to um, clarify that with Facebook. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I know it's more of I think it's more of uh, baka yung algorithms ng Facebook hindi niya na detect properly, de ba? Because usually if somebody if somebody purchases or uh, licenses a work from a stock audio website, so better channel license to use it. Baka yung mm -hmm. algorithms ng Facebook, hindi niya, syempre, hindi siya aware na, na the user who uploaded it has, uh, has a license. license to use the work, di ba? So baka na pa-flag lang. Kaya in any case naman, I believe that Facebook gives the uploader an option to unmute, di ba? If he believes that he has the right to play the music, di ba? So the, parang, kumbaga, after mo ma-flag, uh, you are given an option to unmute. Diba? So, pwede naman niya i-unmute, diba? Kasi meron naman siyang right talaga to play it. Okay. Um, there's a question here. I think this is appropriate for the IPO office. Uh, do we still need to apply for an ISBN? For, I guess, I think this is a question in relation to teaching modules. ISBN? ISBN the ISBN uh, number, <clears throat> ISBN code. Isn't that uh, handled by the Oh, maybe not by the IPO, know, but no. by the National <laughs> Library. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, oh, with the IPO. Uh -oh. That's right, that's right. I'm sorry. I think previously, uh, the you go to the National Library, and that's where you deposit, make your deposit. At the same time, they give you your ISBN, so you, you're in and out, two in one. But the IP office now is uh, taking in deposits for, um, for copyright purposes. Can, can you explain, uh, anyone from the IP office can explain? What's the what's the purpose of, of making a deposit for copyright? Director Emmer. Uh, yes. Uh, good, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, sorry for late joining. Uh, we were just also in a webinar with the Philippine group of li law libraries. Uh, anyway, uh, while uh, copyright protects uh, the author of a work uh, from the moment of its creation, from the moment of creating a literary or artistic work, there are certain advantages to registering or depositing your work. One would be uh, to have a physical evidence, an additional uh, uh, a certificate would, uh, would prove your, not prove, uh, I have to be technical here, would be an evidence that you can use uh, for your ownership of the copyright. And we were informed by uh, our clients uh, for this particular service that uh, may mga users, especially sa mga foreign jurisdictions that would require them to submit proof or evidence that they are indeed uh, the owner of this copyright before siya engage or uh, uh, bilhin or enter into a contract with these foreign users. So I think those are the immediate uh, uh, advantages of uh, registering your work, even if uh, copyright protection vests from the moment of creation. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Brian uh, Pabustan, uh, who I think is also a, uh, a musician. Certainly, there was a he posted a comment earlier about uh, about Metallica, uh, oh. Lars Ulrich in particular, and the lawsuit that he brought uh, against Napster. So. Uh, that was on the chat, uh, Marivik. I don't know if you noticed that. I think the question is for you. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do we deal with recordings that are not properly reissued? Uh, and the only way to access those recordings is either through secondhand vinyl or pirated needle drop CDs. Ah, needle drop CD copies. I guess people are I recording. Needle, your CD. <laughs> needle drop CDs. How does that? How, how did they make that? Needle drop kata yung parang vinyl, ano, parang vinyl rip. Parang ripping ah, from the vinyl source into, uh, into so CD format. Yes, uh, uh, they play and record. Mm -mm. How do I feel about that? Well, actually, uh, for example, 
uh, sometimes I have to look for a song that I have rights to. I may have rights to. I'm not talking about, uh, let's say, star music per se, because th that's a young catalog. But uh, I also handle this old catalog that I might not have. Uh, I saw I have the right to the song, but I don't have a copy of the recording. So I actually uh, research on YouTube for that. And there's no, parang, do we really have a choice? Um, if there's no copy, it's better to have an archive copy somewhere in the internet and then later to claim it from YouTube. Claim it, uh, claim the revenues from YouTube if you can. Okay, so it's, I'll, I'll push you on one more question because you mentioned the word catalog, right? Yes. So what is it? So you have, a, you have a, let's say, thousands of songs, right, in this catalog of yours. Uh, maybe some songs, I don't know, maybe 20% we know, the rest we don't know. Um, as a business, what, 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 is, what is involved in, uh, in trying to make money from a catalog? Is that something that, that you think is uh, uh, profitable or something that you can make money on? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, for example, for YouTube and uh, Spotify, if it's a compose, composition catalog, there is money, some money to be made because uh, uh, YouTube, for example, will send a list of 2 million uh, uh, songs that they feel have been used but are unidentified. So to Philscap, for example, and then Philscap will identify. And somehow in those 2 million songs, there might be a few that actually had revenues. And there might be actually, uh, we have one case in a, in a star uh, where we had a two, 2005 release of a song called Chicken Song. And uh, there are actually very few lyrics, mostly just the chicken cockling. Uh, Is that what, cackling? Is that what you call it? So, <laughs> Uh, and it's just a, I don't know if it was a dance uh, music release at that time or it's a children's song, but uh, it was released in 2005. And for some reason, uh, we, were, we knew that, that that was there, but it wasn't, it wasn't really famous here in the Philippines. Uh, and then for some reason, somebody did a remix of it and, claimed, and put it up on YouTube and claimed it, but he's not from the Philippines. So that was back in 2013. And only last April 23 of this year, we we uh, learned this version was there, and um, for some reason, the claims of the the song uh, suddenly became ours, and it uh, the claim was dropped on the side of that person who was claiming it before, and suddenly it became ours. And at the time that uh, YouTube awarded it to us, it was 300 million views already worldwide. And uh, right now, that's the song that's uh, allowing us to survive this pandemic because it's like uh, getting a, more than a million views a day. And uh, that's translating to revenues for us. So it's good to have a catalog because you never know what songs will, uh, will make it not in your territory, but in another territory. And the territory I'm talking about actually is India. And we don't know why it's famous in India, why... Do Indians like chicken? Maybe. <laughs> uh, chicken dance, that's our uh, unicorn song for this year. And uh, that's what happened. So it's, it's always good to have to, to keep your library um, you know, well uh, accounted for. And, uh, so you, to, can, you yes, can collect. You can, claim, you can collect this. Okay. There's a question here. I think that might be uh, good for the IPO to answer. Um, so it's from Elizabeth Mendoza. She asks, uh, I, I think she's a dancer. She says, uh, we would like, her group, I think her group, would like to feature past international performances, which we sponsored. Yeah. The founder of the Dance for Theater uh, passed away. And they're asking, I, I think the question is that they recorded old performances. And they're asking, she's asking, do I still need to request permission from the dancers to show via FB and free TV. So I guess she sponsored it, she recorded it, and she's asking, uh, do I need to look for the dancers whose performances were in the video? I think that's uh, for the IPO. For if someone can. Getting, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> so it would deal with the, uh, no, no, with uh, uh, getting permission from the dancers featured in the video, right? So yes. uh, <clears throat> 
that would uh, that would be that would fall under the yung performers rights sa tetawag under the related rights diba so uh, under under related rights a dancer has uh, the right to uh, kumbaga meron siyang say kung merong bang mag uh, magpa, mag magpapakita to the public ng any video ng kanyang performance diba so in this case yes uh, i believe that uh, um kung maaari kailangan siguro ng hingin yung permission ng mga dancers para before ma execute mapakita or ba exhibit to the public yung video nila. Okay. Meron nung, uh, and I think this is a question po na I think good for the IPO to answer again. I'm sorry. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is a question actually that uh, that we were tackling no, in here in uh, in UP at the University of the Philippines. Kasi now everyone is making all their course packs for online uh, distribution. And usually ang question is uh, fair use. So yes, we're so, educators, actually. we are... <laughs> We are making materials available online. Sabi nila, if I have a copyrighted work and I include it in my teaching module, is that covered within fair use because it's educational purpose? Yes, uh, actually, uh, yung, yung, yung bureau namin, we're actually uh, uh, handling a lot of uh, fair use issues ngayon, diba? uh, lalo na with the shift to uh, distance learning. Diba? So, <coughs> including a copyrighted work in a module um that would depend siguro kung kung paano i mean kung paano ang distribution ng module kung kunyari kung ta, kung uh, talagang yung students lang in a select class ang makikinabang di ba the uh, it might fall under fair use di ba kasi as we all know uh, very flexible naman ang ang fair use wala naman talagang uh, hard and fast rules dito di ba so given na uh, um the fair use factors are complied with and uh, strictly talagang for educational purposes lang siya, then it, it, there, there, it's a good chance na makalusot siya under fair use. Okay. There's a follow-up question here. I think it's relevant from Rafael Giolanda. He said, uh, do we still need to apply for copyright for our digital copy of our textbook? So I guess he had a textbook that was already created before printed. Now they made a digital copy. He's asking, do, do they still need to make file or apply for copyright? I guess with the IPO for the uh, for the co- digital copy. So I'm assuming na merong silang copyright registration for the physical copy, and then yung digital, they're asking kung panibagong application. Yes, I, well that's one. Yes, one option. That's uh, correct. Yes. In, a, in in such a case, yes, uh, panibagong application yung uh, para to cover the uh, the electronic copy. Okay. So, the, very uh, interesting question, anonymous question just came in. No? Uh, if a portrait of a person is originally taken by photography, but is recreated by paint, I guess photographed by one person, and then recreated by paint by another artist, is there infringement? Depends. <clears throat> Copyright infringement, of a it, it, it would uh, have to defend, uh, depend on the particular facts of the case. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, we've heard of cases, di ba, uh, copyright infringement may claim na ganyan, na copyright infringement siya. So, just because you transform it from one form to another does not mean that uh, there is no infringement committed. So, it will have to def- uh, depend uh, a lot, to a lot of extent on ano ang nakopya, anong aspects ng photo, photograph ang kinopya ng tao. Okay. Uh, for the IPO though, what are the rules on reuse or reposting of webinars? Ah, like this webinar. <laughs> ano daw? Siguro merong, ano, merong uh, webinar and then uh, i repost nila po. Would, you, would there be copyright uh, issues po? I th- Chuck, you would you like to answer? Uh, <laughs> siguro, no, kasi... Saan nila i-repost? Diba? Una-una yun yung tanong. Kasi kung right. if they will just provide a link, kuyari sa Facebook, personal Facebook page sila, if they will just provide a link that will bring the user to the to the uh, Facebook, halimbawa, ito, nitong DDT. Kasi diba, right. dag, 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 we are on live stream now. Kung Opa. ganun lang, then uh, I guess walang, in, walang infringement doon, diba? But if, mm. uh, if, they, if they would somehow obtain uh, a soft copy nung ano nung webinar and then it i-post nila sa personal website nila 
then that that might be a case for infringement so diba so depende sa kung paano nila i-share publicly right right i think i think mm-hmm. that's uh, that's fair i mean if you're already mm-hmm. like in this case if we're posting it free on uh, on facebook if you share it from facebook the parang we we are saying give it away for free may parang implied implied the uh, uh, license i think that that's correct um there's a question here i think that's proper for marivic is there a site that provides Filipino folk songs or OPM that already belongs to the public domain. So just to, ano, just to be clear, uh, public Wish. domain means that the work uh, was one, either never covered by copyright because copyright is only 200 years old, or there was copyright, but the copyright had already expired. And copyright yes. expires uh, 50 years after the death of the author. If we're 50, no? 75 ata elsewhere, mm-hmm. but in the Philippines is 50. So two generations now yan of, uh, of heirs who will take advantage. So uh, Marivic, is there any um, site that provides Filipino folk songs or OPM that belongs in the public domain? Uh, I wish there was. I, I'm not aware of the site right now. Uh, we already, uh, in, in another consultation meeting, that was also suggested that we keep a site uh, that just says, yeah, that's for, uh, that uh, classifies some songs as public domain or has uh, uh, you know the copyright has expired or um, the one problem is that uh, for example uh, I ask for example Phil Scrap to give us dates of death of composers <laughs> and it's a, kind of a weird request so um, they're still considering whether they should do that or not so it's sor- sort of morbid to keep a list of the dates of the deaths of composers right. so, but you need to eh I know, but there. Uh, I hope there's somewhere that we can that uh, can you know we can uh, record it, and just just for the purpose of um, of uh, determining when the copyright will expire. There are some composers. Uh, there are a number of composers whose copyright have already expired. Uh, yes, but, but if we're talking about say OPM, seventies and sixties, chances are the composers are still alive. Or they, they, it's not yet 50 years since their death. Uh, oh, oh, for sure. Hindi pa. Pero hindi yung, pa expired. Hindi pa. I'm talking about like Nick Canor Abelardo and the, yung mga Suarez. Mga 1950 <clears throat> na mga kumbu. Yeah, these are monster hits that are... Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, so, yes, yes. those are also There's a question hits. here. There's a question here that uh, I think is good for you, uh, uh, Marivik. Just a follow on. So somebody um, uh, wrote songs. And then... Uh, Raylan, so lalaki yata ito, no? he paid an arranger to arrange his songs. Ang tanong niya is, who owns the copyright? And then, you know, how do they divide the royalties? So, you write the song, I make the arrangement. How do we divvy it up? Depende sa agreement. If you paid and uh, you agreed na commission work yun and you you own it, yeah. Then, uh, yeah. then you own it. But if it's a collaborative work, but there's also some composers or some arrangers who claim that eh, yung composition naman pangit pa naman nung una eh, or walang forma nung una. I was the one who came in and put form in the composition. Maybe uh, the stanzas were not complete so he was the one who fixed it. So mm. that can also be considered as a collaboration and uh, the, the um, arranger can also be entitled to copyright in, because of the inputs that he gave, diba? But uh, so that, that's Yeah, that's a very interesting you know. So there are different, ano kasi, so I mean, uh, you can write uh, a basic tune, but I tweak it a little, and then uh, you're entitled to uh, copyright. Yeah. Minsan yung usual na, ano yung, uh, somebody contributes a bridge. Yun yung usual na kulang nung, ano, nung music. Like, uh, mm-hmm. you should, sometimes, uh, uh, more common than, than uh, we think. Yung the bridge is, uh, uh, somebody else gives that bridge because... Uh, you need to have a parang a different my um point of view eh, to to give that bridge. So uh, right. sometimes that's the contribution. So, so some yeah. uh, songwriters will agree like uh, okay, give me ten percent uh, because I wrote the bridge. So it's important to have the split sheet at the end of the composition process. It's important to have that agreement mm. between composers uh, as to yung shares nila and what they compose because yeah. Uh, later on, when you're friends and you're young, it doesn't matter. But later on, it will matter. So yun, that's ah. important. It so that's interesting. I think in the in the music industry, so two things come to mind. There's that song, the theme song from Arthur, the movie, 
uh, there's that line, yung Christopher Cross, di ba? Uh, be, uh, caught, uh, caught between the moon and New York City. So there's one guy, that's it, that is his entire contribution to the song, just that line. If you get caught between the moon and New York City, and the reason he thought of that line, because he got stuck in a, uh, yung di magland yung plane niya. So he just kept going oh, around. Okay. Said, I'm just between okay. the moon uh, and New York City. Uh, and that's his contribution. Uh, he got one third, one third of the royalties ata. And I think he also got uh, an Oscar award because he won best, <laughs> best theme song. But did, did he sue for it or he was given credit talaga? No, no, no. He was given credit from the beginning. What's funny is that, you know, pero kasi sabi nila, that's the hook. But that's so you iconic. Know, the song works. Oh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, the song, yeah, the song makes, the, the line makes the song. So that's Kahit mong one line lang, di ba? Yun na yung pinaka, ano, ng yes. essence right. ng kantay. Na, uh, uh, yes. Oh, right. So I think they were happy to give it to him. Uh, mm-hmm. Another one was uh, um, the band Bamboo. So what they did in Bamboo is very uh, intentional on their part. Because uh, I think for a lot of the musicians, they were already, this is their second recording contract. So my understanding, if you look at the credits, it's all the five of them. Uh, also four, all of the members equally share in the copyright. And it was intentional. Walang, hindi yung parang uh, John yeah. Lennon, uh, uh, Paul McCartney sort Paul McCartney. of thing where, mm-hmm. yeah, so that all, everyone shares so that when they, when the royalty check comes, it's, uh, it's divided up. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, there's a question here for, I think proper for I, IPO. Um, and actually, you know, I, I see this on the internet, yung CTTO, so, no una ako, ano yung CTTO? <laughs> Papakita sila ng picture, CTTO. What's that? Apparently, it stands for credit to credit the owner. Credit to, to the owner. For posting or sharing. And uh, ano pong, uh, what can you say about that? Is that when you say CTTO, okay ka na ba? You're protected from copyright infringement? Uh, of course not. Kasi, di ba? I mean, anybody can just put uh, a CTTO notice or even yung copyright symbol, di ba? Pero hindi naman siya legally binding in the sense na porque naglagay ka doon, it means na ikaw ang copyright owner, di ba? So, uh, yung CTTO, di ba? Uh, let's not, uh, let's not believe the misconception na porque nag-upload tayo ng, uh, ng work and then naglagay tayo ng CTTO, it means na absuelto na tayo sa uh, possible infringement kung sakali man na yung original copyright owner ay uh, um, mag-abol, kumbaga, di ba? Correct, correct. So yes. I was thinking, uh, parang mm-hmm. CTTO is like the difference between plagiarism and copyright infringement. Binigyan mo lang ng credit yung, yung owner na sabi mo, oh, galing sa kanya to. Pero you can still commit copyright infringement even yes, though uh, uh, you gave credit to the, to the other person. May uh, question po dito. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll answer this question. Uh, his friend is a computer programmer and he's asking how he can protect his rights to computer programs. So... Ang, uh, and, and of course, feel free to jump in, uh, anyone. So my understanding of the way uh, pro- computer programmers are protected. So computer programs under the IT code are protected by copyright, uh, which is sort of strange when you look at the list of uh, works protected by copyright. Yeah, music, uh, written works, ganon. So bakit computer program? Uh, medyo out of place siya, uh, in my view. No? Uh, now, how are you protected? Now, computer program, as I understand it, para exist on on in two forms. No, on one form, it's source code. It's a bunch of yes. text and lines that you write. So you have copyright to that, uh, but you also have to understand that uh, yung ex- the extent of your copyright to that might be limited uh, by what you call the idea expression dichotomy, because it might be that there are only a few ways to express that that uh, that idea on on source code so you might your rights might be limited but very clearly your source code the way you write it is covered by copyright and if somebody cuts and paste inuwan niya yung code mo cut and paste that would be uh, copyright infringement uh, the other level at which copyright protects uh, uh, computer programs is uh, when source code is compiled into the executable form yan na yung kiniklik natin double click that's the executable form of the program if you copy that program, that's also a source of uh, copyright infringement. And another way you violate infr- uh, copyright infringement is if you take somebody's source code as well, dadagdagan mo or babawasan mo, things like that, that would constitute copyright infringement. So when you're in this industry, uh, in, the, in the software industry, you want to be careful about your programmers taking their code from company to company because that, that uh, software might actually belong uh, to, the, to the employees. Uh, may mga, uh, ano dito, uh, let me see. 
Uh, okay, so sabi, just a comment. In a tri- ah, that's a comment. Hold on. Let me just ask, look for another question here. How can we know that the copy, uh, that we can copy pictures on Google? So you, they search on Google, there are all these pictures. Can they, just because they appear on Google, can they be used uh, in their poster or brochure? Especially for tourist destinations now. So this must be a brochure for uh, tourists. Uh, ano. Would you recommend uh, that, Paul? Uh, of course, hindi. Kasi, di ba, uh, Another common misconception is uh, porket it's online uh, and madali and meron tayong feature na pwede natin siyang i-save image, diba? It means na free to share na agad yun. Uh, of course, that, uh, it would depend actually if the image is already in the public domain or covered by a, a, a Creative Commons license that allows it to be reused, diba? Uh, but uh, ang ano dito is Actually, most of the images found online, uh, these are actually uh, copyrighted works, diba? So, yung common practice na yung parang mag-save image ka lang or copy-paste lang, uh, uh, it's actually infringement dahil hindi ka naman nagpapaalam doon sa, do sa copyright owner, diba? So, we have to, you have to check. Normally, pag nag-click mo yung image, meron doon parang maliit na disclaimer sa baba uh, na halagay, images may be subject to copyright, diba? So, you have to check right. the terms, diba? Kung kung covered version ng copyright or kung so hindi ka kung public domain kasi kung public domain siya di walang problema pwede mong gamitin di ba that's right that's right uh, actually may mga sorry go yeah. since you're to uh, attorney ator, ator kuya po uh, since you're talking about Google actually you can uh, use a particular feature of Google uh, filter if you go to advanced uh, settings you can actually put there uh, that it will just search for pictures that are free to share or free to use. Then it will just give you the portions or the pictures that are that will meet that particular filter. Okay, thank you, Paul. And there's a follow-on question for you, Attorney uh, Kuyo. Uh, in a copyright registration, I mean, uh, if, they, if they have a song, and it has a Tagalog and English version, sabi nila. Do you have to register separately the Tagalog um, version and the English version? I guess of the lyrics, no? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I think that would be separate works. Requiring uh, separate preso, say, attorney Kuyo. So that, that would be separate works. Uh, I think so also, no? Uh, ayan, Attorney Kuyo, sorry, you, you got cut off. You said they were separate works? Uh, they are separate works. Sorry, my internet here is un- inst- unstable. Uh, they are separate works, and therefore, I would advise them to register it as separate works. Okay. Paano, ma- paano po kung, uh, what if they fail to register? Is that, uh, is that a problem for, uh, for these uh, authors and musicians? Uh, kasi may kuminsan hindi nila priority po yan eh, uh, to register their copyright if they fail to register are they uh, uh, may meron bang masama na mangyayari sa kanila with respect to their copyright uh, wala naman po because it's uh, protected nga from the moment of creation but uh, in good times sabi ko nga when I do the lectures I always say in good times okay yan pero if somebody copied their work already and they need to prove that they are the owner of that song then that's where uh, may added value ang na-register or na-deposit mo yung work. But copyright protection will be there from the moment you create the work. Right. So actually, may comment dito from uh, Marian Cebulo. Uh, sabi niya, uh, is it register or is it deposit? So maybe uh, I, I, I'll take the blame for that. I, I use the word register. Uh, uh, we also follow the WIPO definition. Pag-register kasi, Ang WIPO definition, WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization. Register is used to refer to record plus actual deposit. So pag recordation lang siya, meaning itinatala mo lang siya sa isang uh, listahan. That's recordation. For example, of a recordation, yung bit of assignment. Di ba pag namatay na yung owner and you're the heir, you are actually required under the law to have it recorded before the National Library. Uh, so, yun po, recordation yun. So, but pag sinamahan mo siya ng actual deposit of the work, which is what you do when you do uh, deposit with us, so kaya ang tinatawag na po namin registration because that's how 
it's defined. Recordation plus deposit equals registration. Okay. So, uh, as you said, the, uh, the recording or the deposit does not create the copyright because you already have copyright. Yes. If you're, sabi nga nung ano, the moment the pen leaves the paper, the moment your hands leave the keyboards, the moment you're, you, know, you, you strum it, that, that song, the first time on your guitar, the copyright is for your lifetime plus 50 years. Oh, so paka, sometimes when I, when I have speaking engagements, I go, you take a pen, you make a scribble on a piece of paper, okay, lift the pen, you have copyright over that work in your hand, right, for your lifetime plus 50 years. There's no need to, to register. But, the regi ang maganda, sorry, not register, but record or deposit. But the advantage of going to the IPO and making the deposit is that it creates a timestamp. May proof ka, because IPO will accept and they will record, no? Uh, may proof ka that as of that date, you made a claim that that work belongs to you. So later when somebody infringes, mailalabas mo yung certification from the IPO na as of this date, ikaw ang may-ari niyan. Actually, there was uh, somebody mentioned to me what they call the poor man's copyright. And a poor man's copyright now is you write your work, you make your work, and then you uh, mail it to yourself. You put it in an envelope, you go to the post office, and you mail it to yourself, and you seal it. And then when, when a lawsuit happens later, you open up the envelope and you say, ito ah, the post office said that this was mailed on this date, and it will prove that as of that date, the work already existed. So, but that's the same uh, idea with the IP office. It establishes, kumbaga sa computer eh, date stamp, ano yun? date time stamp. Yan tong uh, value po ng uh, recordation. So if you do it, uh, you should, uh, if you have a chance to do it, please do so. And I think the, the online facility offered by the IPO now is a, is a great uh, no, innovation that will help uh, our artists protect their rights further. Is that, uh, ano po, may, is that free or is that a, a small, is there a small fee po to, to uh, record their uh, copyright? Uh, yes, for NCR, uh, it's 460. And for outside NCR, it's 500 plus. Okay, okay. Um, let me see. Uh, Dami questions. Yes, Go ahead. Have, yeah, sir. We have a question about there's a recent issue, um, but feel free to mention if you don't want to answer it, of course. That the eraser head, um, Eddie Wendia, was referring to an issue um, that Huling El Bimbo, um, someone earned one million for a one year management contract, and he copied and ripped off the musical arrangement of the um, of the of the production. So what is, I mean, is it really um, an infringement or is he really entitled for, for to win that? And uh, what is your take? Okay. Uh, so let me, let, me, let, let me preface <laughs> kasi baka, I don't know if uh, our, our panelists are, uh, are aware. Uh, so there was, a, um, there, was, uh, there was a contest of some sort and then somebody won. Now, one of his entries was a video of a cover version of uh, Pareko. Uh, and it was, uh, it had this uh, drum solo. It was, it was uh, parang martial, parang, uh, parang military style. And he won. Uh, it turns out that it, it because there's the, there's the play, the, the musical, uh, Ang Huling El Bimbo. And in, in that musical, uh, they turned Pareko into, ano, yung CMT. Right, yung uh, no CMT. So they it was martial and there was a lot of ano. And the, the somebody showed compared it that there were many elements, uh, uh, including chord progressions, right, in the arrangement that were the same as the one in uh, in Ang Huling El Bimbo. And the big question that came out, of course, was was that copyright infringement? Yun ang, uh, yun yung tanong. And, uh, and 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 it's unfair if you haven't watched it because it might be. Unfair. I, I, I was hesitating to ask kasi kung hindi okay, kung hindi nyo napanood, baka unfair for me to ask that question. But if you have uh, an opinion, uh, we'd love to hear it. Can we, can I answer that? Uh, yes, uh, we were able to watch it. And uh, yung primary reaction namin was, bakit hindi ni-screen ng organizers? It should have been the responsibility of the organizers to screen infringement but as to whether or not uh, there's infringement yan ang hindi namin muna sasagutin dahil baka mamaya may kaso <laughs> i was thinking the same thing so we do not want to prejudge uh, the case uh, 
uh, let them di ba, uh, file the necessary case for infringement then yun lang uh, so we would like to ask uh, organizers uh, to screen di ba, yung mga entries to make sure that there's no infringement involved opo opo ako sa that's uh, that's very good ano so now, now I'll put uh, Marivic Benedicto on the on the spot what do you think Marivic <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of that issue yeah hindi ako nag-unmute kasi tumatahol yung aso kanina so <laughs> <laughs> but um it depends on the rules of the contest okay so if the contest right. allows the ano the uh it depends on what kasi ano sinasabi uh, parang 40% creativity so dapat bagsak ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so it depends kung uh, if the arreglo was the choice of the you know, and he passed it off as his and he has to be uh, responsible for that but the material is not really the the contestant yata but the ano, organizer diba and uh, right. in fairness naman to the organizer they actually approached the publishers before they ano, before they started that contest kaya lang they didn't I don't I don't think they hindi ko naman song so hindi nila ako in approach I don't think if they they approached the ano the publisher talaga for to upload that that video on YouTube. So if they did not right. then there is an infringement but if they got the license talaga from the from the ano from the publisher hmm there's no infringement as far as the song is concerned. Pero yung musical arrangement ba na own yon. world yon di ba? Meron din doon, may issue din doon. So yeah, so you know, you know, the question, you know, I mind. So, uh, insofar as the licensing is concerned, pasado siguro. Insofar as the composition is concerned, the question is, what copyright or does a copyright belong to the arranger? Because it's a different arrangement. Eh? Yes. And uh, and the, and the the elements are so similar to each other that uh, I think you could uh, you could argue that uh, there's uh, there's a possibility that. Uh, there was and it's too it's too it's too close to each other in terms of, of the arrangement but then again i think it will it will be a question of how much of that is really copy, covered by copyright and uh, and maybe we should stop talking because and uh, just to inform <laughs> our uh, our audience members that uh, the intellectual property office has jurisdiction over uh, violations of intellectual property rights if i'm not mistaken i think for cases above 200,000 pesos in terms of damages and so, in other words, this is a uh, this is good for artists and creators because then they can file a case uh, in an agency that has specialized knowledge uh, with respect to intellectual property matters. And uh, the decision of uh, it's filed, I believe, at the Bureau of Legal Affairs, uh, and then uh, it's appealable to the uh, Director General, and then so on and so forth. So you could you could um, you could get some remedies if you're the victim of intellectual property violation, not just copyright law, but also for trademark, I believe, and, uh, and, and patent. So the IP office is open, and that's why they're not commenting, because they <laughs> <bumaksak> sa <kanila. laughs> All right. Um, this is an interesting question. Can torrent sites be held liable for infringement, given that they do not share the files themselves, but only provide information for others to to share the files directly. So in, in the way a torrent works is that when I click on a torrent, I what is I, I plug myself into other people who are sharing a file and then it directly between them and us. So the question is, the person who provide me that link, are they, am I liable from the IP office? I don't know if uh, it's a fair question to ask. I, I think uh, attorney Louis, if he's still here, maybe he, he can share the case of uh, uh, Rainier, which is yes. essentially. Uh. Well, the uh, comment ko lang would be the law itself. Uh, we, we have a provision in 216 of the copyright law, which is part four of the IP code, which provides for secondary liability. So theoretically, mm -hmm. anybody who either benefits from an infringing activity of another and he has knowledge of the infringing activity and he has right to control. So he can be secondarily liable and he could also be secondarily liable if he materially contributes. Uh, that's under another, I, uh, no, another way of hmm. committing uh, copyright infringement no, under the IP code. So, ganon. So if, if you are somebody who has, if, 
even if you you are not the one who directly committed the infringement, but you either benefited from it or materially contributed from it, then you could be held secondarily liable. Yeah. Theoretically. Okay. <laughs> May follow-up question ako sa iyo. Ah, oh, ako ah, din. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Maribig. Mm -hmm. Ako muna. Uh, so, ano ba? Uh, yung ano ba? If you enable uh, the people to pirate intellectual property, aren't you liable nga? Because you enable them and it's the only way that they can uh, have access is to your is to your program or your system. Uh, you well, want to answer? <laughs> well, <laughs> kasi uh, go ahead, Attorney Louie. Well, again, you know, two one six letter C <laughs> materially uh -huh. contributing, I suppose. Because if you were the one who you were the one who contributed the link, you know, mayan. Yeah, okay. without uh, which the, the act could not be Not just the link, but the uh, yung ano mismo. Kanyari, Pirate Bay itself. Uh, ah, okay. Mm. If, is Pirate Bay itself liable yeah. for the torrent? So there's a... Uh, ang sinasabi kasi nung... In the, let me just take the case of Pirate Bay. If I were the lawyer for Pirate Bay, I would say, oh, we have this system. There are people sharing this information. We can't control what they do. But if you say your right is being infringed, you report to us, we'll take it down. But you know what people are sharing, we don't. What people are putting on our site, we don't know what it is. So you can't hold us liable for copyright infringement. Now, I'll, I'll go one step further and say, well, you know, um, I think in the U.S., one of the things that they were looking at is what they call willful blindness. Or sa tagalog eh, nagbubulag bulagan. Hindi naman pwedeng defense na hindi mo alam when in fact when you look at your content, it's you know 95% uh, copyrighted work. I think one one of the reasons why naging um, one of the problems uh, that that makes this issue complicated is the fact that, and as we discussed earlier, copyright from the moment of creation is there. It it is created. Nandun na yung copyright, uh, and therefore, uh, and then copyright. So copyright is private, and copyright licenses license to use copyrighted works. Is uh is not known. There's no public registry for for all copyright licenses. So in other words, it's very hard for somebody to know whether that is a licensed use or not. There's a story I like to tell, and uh, it's good the IPO is here. So, but I think I got this from Attorney Louis Calvario, and then so credit to the to the owner. <laughs> so I don't CTTO. know. But, but, <laughs> CDTO, CDTO. So the story is this. Uh, the story is this. This is in the old offices of the IP office in uh, in Buendia. Supposedly, there was a uh, DVD seller. This is back when DVDs were being sold in front of the IP office okay. in Buendia. And just imagine the irony, diba? You have a DVD seller in front. And, okay, so the, my question is this. What did the IP office do? Pinarate ba nila yon? Did they arrest? Did they do anything? And supposedly the story goes, and the story that I like to tell, uh, and as a teaching moment, right? Supposedly, sabi daw ng, IP, uh, sabi daw ng taga IPO, pwede ba ma'am, wag kayo dito magbenta, doon na kayo magbenta sa may malapit sa DTI kasi nakakahiya. And, and that, that gives rise to, I know it's funny, <laughs> ano, ano, uh, kasi parang, oh, why did they do that? Why didn't they arrest? And the, the answer is this, right? Uh, there's no way, it's very hard for the IP office to look at all these movies and hindi naman nun alam kung may licensing agreements. Until, and this is really a, one of the lessons I think in, in, in copyright or intellectual property, if you're the owner of, of copyrighted works, you should be the one to complain, right? You can't expect the IPO to protect your rights pag hindi ka nagsumbong sa IPO. You have to give the IP office the information so the IP office can, ano. Kung baga sabi ko, it's like a gun eh. You know, it's cock, but you, you have to, it's the copyright uh, owner who has to pull the trigger so the IP office can exercise uh, all its authority because it's very hard, if not impossible, for the IP office to uh, take action when it doesn't have uh, all of the information. What, uh, mm -hmm. Is that a true story, Attorney Calvario? Or, uh, well, actually, that I'll just keep on thing. spreading it. That was hearsay uh, on my part. But <laughs> 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 And, and, and that was, ano, kasi at during that time, wala, hindi pa na-amend ang IP code nung right. Republic Act 10372. And at that time, walang enforcement powers ang IPO. I mean, we could only uh, uh, collaborate with the enforcement agencies and ask them to, ano, to, to do that. Like yun, DVD siyan. 
CD. So it should be the optical media board at that time. Nandun yata right. si Attorney Marivic noon. No, no. I think back then, wala pang optical media board. This is way, way back. Way, way back. And then, uh, uh, and then you're right. The, the law has been amended. And the IP office now has a right, has the power to enforce. So there's, there's this uh, power no, that uh, the IP office uh, can, can do that. Um, and I guess, so if ma matanong ko lang, is, do you see now in, in the IP office that there is a decrease in uh, infringement from, uh, from the 90s? Is, are we seeing uh, better enforcement now in terms of, uh, or respect by our users of intellectual property? Well, uh, I don't have the records right now, pero, well, many people now have uh, uh, no, at least a working idea about what IP is, what copyright is. Hindi siya masyadong technical, but at least uh, through the years kasi naman, di ba, IPO has uh, uh, and, uh, conducted many you know, uh, seminars, conferences, and ano. so unti -unti, we're going to that ano, level now where uh, people will have really a working knowledge. But, uh, yun, I suppose wala na naman nagtitinda rin dito sa harap ng <laughs> So, that's an improvement, I think. <laughs> maliit yung, maliit yung, uh, maliit yung uh, sidewalk nyo dyan eh. Tapos may driveway pa. <laughs> so, yeah. masasagasahan siya. Can I answer that? Opa. Uh, the advent of technology, uh, especially online, uh, Wi-Fi, ICT, uh, mas madaling mag ano ngayon eh. Mas madaling mag-pirate, mas madaling magbenta ng counterfeit goods. Diba? As shown uh, in our records, uh, increasing yung piracy uh, violations, not only illegal streaming, mga, uh, not only infringement of copyright, but also uh, sale of counterfeit goods. So, mas madali ngayon mag-fake and mas madali ring mag-put uh, up ng sites, no? Na, yung mga pirate uh, sites na hindi rin natin kilala uh, who are the owners because uh, as soon as they're taken down, meron na naman mga bago, no? So, so yun, uh, dati DVD lang siguro ang problema. <laughs> But ngayon, it has uh, been elevated to a more complicated uh, reproduction, not only of uh, products, but also of yung, uh, yeah, the ease of uh, uh, reproducing uh, songs, uh, movies, etc. Thank you, Paul. I mean, that, that's really relevant. I think... Uh... Uh, one of the important uh, functions. And I think people don't uh, realize uh, because ang inisip na nila puro DVD or what or movies or songs but I think one of the more important functions of the intellectual property office is uh, in public safety. You know, things like uh, fake uh, pharmaceuticals, right? Those are, uh, it's very important to enforce uh, patents so that uh, I remember there was a case before na uh, as a young lawyer I handled for a pharmaceutical company because uh, the 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 bottles etc were being sold, uh, and this, this was for antibiotics, and uh, they were putting powder with very little antibiotics. And uh, the the not the irony, but uh, the, it was criminal really, you no? Know, because the pharmaceuticals were being sold in Viluna Hospital, so these were soldiers that were you know some corrupt uh, pharmacist was selling buying these uh, fake products at a lower price, pocketing the difference. So, it would be one thing for to talk about, you know, maybe a song is less harmful than than fake medicine. So that's really part, I think, of the the important role that uh, the IP office is, uh, is uh, teaching us, you know, in respect of intellectual property. Uh, thank you for that. So um, I have a question here for Marivik. Uh, for cover songs, napaka common ngayon yan, no? Uh, you go on YouTube, you sing a song. Uh, is it infringing though or not? Given that the original song is covered by copyright, if I uh, if I make a uh, uh, if I sing my way, for example, um, YouTube is within YouTube. YouTube has an agreement with the publishers and with Philscap for performance and mechanical rights. So within YouTube, it's legal because. Uh, YouTube has already uh, facilitated the license by um, facilitated the license by 
uh, getting a license on behalf of the users. But the thing is that uh, for uh, they, they only covered certain rights and not all of the rights. So there's one right that uh, publishers might run after, and it's the synchro right, synchronization right. It's the right to record uh, moving images, to, to right to record the video, actually. Um, on the other hand, uh, in YouTube, um, the publishers are getting, and the composers are getting revenues also from these cover versions. Uh, what Philscap has to do and the publishers have to do is to claim that song and then all of the, all or a big part of the revenues are actually going to them. So, so I guess the, the good side of that is uh, if you're a creative person and you like to sing, you know, I, I see some people, they, they uh, nagdo duet sila online and they video uh -oh. themselves and they post it. You don't have to worry about infringement because YouTube will pay. The, the publisher, and if the yes. publisher doesn't like your version for one reason or another, right, then they'll just take down your video. Just don't take it personally because that's copyright. <laughs> so I, I remember. There's also yeah. another uh, issue there. If you use a minus one of the original recording, uh, that means that, uh, that that can be tracked by the content ID system of YouTube. So that would be oh. as. Um, the version of the recording company that uploaded it. So if you want to do a rec uh, cover version, do it completely original. Record your own uh, acoustic uh, accompaniment or... Uh, acoustic version, no? Uh, acoustic version or do a ukulele <coughs> version or something like that. Uh, don't use a minus one that you probably uh, also lifted from somewhere uh, because that will be protected by the content ID and that can be blocked. So uh, when a record label uh, uploads a song, they usually say either monetize or block. So if if it gets monetized, uh, you will not get a single level from that recording. It will all go to the record uh, label. But if it's blocked, then you, uh, it's taken down automatically. So that's, that's right. to you if you want to do a cover version. Be completely original. Right. I remember there was uh, back when I was in uh, uh, Viva, uh, Princess Diana died, and there's that song by Elton John, "Candle in the Wind." Candle, Candle in, in the Wind. wind. Uh, right. The version for the version for uh, Princess Diana, he prohibited all cover versions, so it's not allowed. He, they won't give a license for that. Because the Amigos to cover non dito sa Pilipinas mm -hmm. in Tagalog, because it was a hit. <laughs> And yes, he refused. Uh, he refused to license. And I wonder, now it makes me think, I, I'll, I'll do a search later in YouTube, if any versions are up. I wonder if his publishers are scouring through YouTube and taking those down. Because I think if he wants to keep the purity of that. Uh, no. So it's really up to that level that they can, uh, that these artists can control their, uh, their works. No? And, that, uh, and, 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 and you know, I think it's a good thing now that I think that's what you're saying, uh, Marifik, is that uh, whereas before uh, there was no uh, money to be made from YouTube, now the publishers and the artists are being compensated. Yes, although it's not as big as they would want to be compensated. Um, yeah, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I got, uh, you okay. got distracted by, uh, <laughs> by Elton John. Uh, <laughs> don't we all? Uh, I, so there's, a, there's a question for, I guess this is proper for the IPO. How long will it take to patent a product? So now I know this is not copyright, but this is more of patent. Uh, and will the patent be considered uh, recognized? For, um, should, I, uh, should we take this question on? Maybe this is an unfair question, but uh, if somebody's willing to answer. It. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the patent is a mahaba yan, no? because there's uh, 18 months confidentiality period. And uh, among the IP rights, uh, I think sila yung medyo matagal, no? uh, especially to process the registration for for patent. But uh, yun, we are uh, seeking ways uh, on how to, to shorten the period. No? And uh, well, hopefully we'll be able to shorten it. Uh, right now, I think... Uh, Yung average namin is down to two years. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, yes, because eighteen months is more than uh, more than a year na. No? So hopefully uh, we'll be able to shorten it back in the next uh, few years. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, 
Uh, I see there's so many questions. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, use of copyright for, for education. Uh, there's a lot of question about uh, educational uh, materials. I wonder if uh, somebody would like to take on that uh, this topic. Um, Elena. <laughs> Uh, actually, we're. I'm sorry. I, it's 5:30. I just noticed the time. We're we're <laughs> we're out of time, and maybe I just like to ask uh, um, Marivik and uh, DG Barba to for like parting thoughts or any of our uh, panelists for parting thoughts. Yes, uh, ladies uh, first, Attorney Marivik. Uh, well, these are very interesting times for copyright. There are so much that can be done because of technology. And uh, it, I mean, everybody can learn from it. Maybe in the next decade, we'll, uh, copyright protection will evolve also uh, to accommodate all of these other ways that, that intellectual property can be used. So we're all excited for that. Yes, uh, again, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, the Sini Law and Attorney JJ, and of course, to my classmates, si Attorney Jor Boted. Uh, well, uh, sabi nga ni Attorney Marivik, these are exciting times. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we in IPO feel, uh, problema lang namin ngayon, uh, because uh, we are a self-sustaining agency, and we do not get any centavo from the national government. So we rely on registration fees. No? And uh, as of last month, uh, we are down 12% no? based on last year's performance. But uh, we're still hopeful that we will catch up. But despite that, uh, we're continuing with our advocacy, with our mandate, especially uh, uh, in, in further strengthening BCRR. No? Uh, as you know, uh, it was only last year na nagkaroon ng mga tao sa BCRR. For the past four years, unfortunately, si Attorney Louie lang yata yung, <laughs> yung staff ng BCRR. No? Uh, but uh, because nga of uh, uh, recognizing that the creative industry is one of the growth drivers and that was identified by Secretary Ramon Lopez of the DTI. Uh, tuloy pa rin yung work namin and uh, we have been uh, meeting with the different groups, with the different creative sectors because alam naman natin, ang laki-laki ng creative sector, no? it's not only singers, it's not only dancers, and then yung mga painters, and then yung authors, so meron pang cultural aspect. No? Um, Hopefully, we'll be able to, to continue advocacy uh, because we found out that most of our creators do not know their rights. So I think it's uh, important that uh, for the next few years, we'll be able to, to provide them with the necessary information, uh, especially on their rights. Because, of course, if they don't know their rights, nila, so... Yun, they they're taking advantage of and hopefully we'll be able to uh, at least magkaroon sila ng uh, yun, necessary incentive to to monetize their works. So yun lang. Uh, hope uh, everybody will be safe and uh, thank you for our experts in copyright for uh, joining me here this afternoon. <laughs> Yes, I'd like to thank uh, thank you to join uh, uh, DG Barba in thanking uh, Attorney Cuyo, Attorney Calvario, and Attorney Valerio for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it added to a very uh, exciting uh, and uh, you know, active uh, discussion. Uh, so that's another, we're at the end of another episode of Digital Transformation Thursday. Uh, um, it's, it's, this is a very, uh, an emerging uh, field still, right? Just when you thought copyright was down and out, uh, it, it's uh, it's still not out for the count. And I think what's interesting, what we've seen in the case of music, and this was the first industry that really came out slugging uh, against uh, digital media. It turns out that they are able to evolve and still thrive. Uh, just recently, uh, it was interesting in the, in the midst of the pandemic, I think uh, Taylor Swift 
drop an album and and that's really i think the, the heart of uh, the copyright industry it's really the creative artists who who bring all of these things and uh, and add to our culture and uh, it's good and i think it's important that uh, we recognize the 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 role that that different people play the industry and uh, the intellectual property office the enforcement actions that are necessary in order to protect uh, uh, not only the artists but also propagation of culture and on that note, uh, we would like to end this uh, this episode. Uh, we have, uh, I think, our next week uh, we will be having uh, a show on uh, information security. So we hope you join us then. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.